1860, the mayor of the city of Detroit, Michigan, commissioned a farmer's market so that the local farmers and the city's citizens of the city of Detroit would be able to get together, no matter what kind of weather it was, to do exchanges and to purchase goods that were made outside of the city. Um, it's a very, very large farmer's market. It was over 245 feet long and 60 feet wide, all timber frame construction uh, with a slate roof. In 1892, um, the then mayor decided that it really was kind of not the best idea to have all of those horses and the things the horses leave behind and um, all of that activity for um, food and fish and meat and everything else in the city. So they built a new market on the east side of Detroit and decommissioned the farmer's market. When they did, they moved it out to Belle Isle, is what you see in this picture, um, and it was used as a stable there for a while. Um, and then after the city no longer needed it for stable space, um, it was leased to the Bell Isle Riding Academy. Um, and they modified the building significantly. As you can see in this picture, they added a second story onto it, put offices on. They added a clear story window all the way along the ridge line for light because they enclosed the entire building in brick. And this would have been done sometime in the early 1900s. By the 1980s, uh, the building had fallen out of use and um, had become very, very derelict. Um, a car ran into it and started a fire. Um, windows were broken by vandals. And basically the building was an eyesore and a homeless habitat. Um, and the city decided they were going to go ahead and destroy the building. But before they did, they suggested that, someone suggested that they get a hold of the Henry Ford Museum and find out if they might be interested in the building for use in their Greenfield Village displays. When I came up to look at this building in 2003 with Jim McCabe, the curator of collections, when we walked inside, it was just astounding how beautiful the building is. The architecture is incredible. The detail is incredible. It's just a, a beautiful structure. And clearly a lot of attention was paid by both the architect and the builder um, to make this so nice. But you can see the modifications to this building also were going to create a challenge. You have clear story windows added to it, which meant they added bracing down to the um, lower purlins, which then damaged some of the braces. And we'll see about that a little bit later in the video. Um, the decoration was just incredible. I mean, the, the braces all the way around the outside of the building had uh, infill, all hand carved filigree work. I refer to it as a snow, snowflake pattern, um, but just beautiful stuff. Outside, the rafter tails were all very, very well decorated. Um, brackets held up the uh, overhangs. And it's just everywhere you looked, there was something that really could catch your eye. In 2003, um, the arrangements had been made for the Henry Ford to take it. And our crew came up and worked with West Shore Services and deconstructed the building and documented it and put it into storage. And after we had finished the documentation of it, we constructed a 3D model of what the building um, would have looked like originally. Um, and it was determined by the Henry Ford Museum that the building was actually too big for a Greenfield Village even. And so four bays were taken out of that uh, structure, two on each end, um, to make it fit in the place that they wanted it to fit. Um, when it came time to begin working on the building again to put it back up in 2020, um, all of the timbers had to have um, lead paint abatement done. And so a warehouse was leased in Romulus, Michigan, where all of these timbers were hauled to. Um, they did the lead abatement work there, and then they moved them into storage in another open part of the warehouse where we could come up then and do the final assessments on those timbers and determine how much damage there really was, how much work it was going to be to fix it, um, just to get a better handle on what was going to need to be done to get this building back in service again. When we did, um, we had problems that we had to repair. Um, as you see here, um, where the offices were built, um, they cut the ends right off of the decorative ends, right off from the timbers so that they wouldn't protrude out into the office space. So we had to put new decorative ends back on these uh, timbers because the offices obviously weren't going back in. Um, here you can see um, where those trusses that I mentioned earlier came down, they cut the ends right off of all of the down braces in the building. And so those were no longer functional to put it back up again. Um, so our solution was to take the braces that only had one good end 
and cut the good end off of one and then splice it into um, another one, eliminating the bad end on that one. So we were able to get half as many braces as we actually needed just out of reusing the braces two for one. The rafters were fairly small. Uh, they were six by six. Um, they only, uh, and they spanned um, pretty good distances, uh, about, uh, let's see, 20, almost 20 feet. Um, and they were only, on, I mean, they were in 10 foot, six inch centers. Um, the engineers were not happy with this. Um, and what we ended up doing was actually um, adding a four by six to the top, which would be hidden in the ceiling of the building and then using structural screws to effectively make the rafters 12 inches deep instead of six inches deep. Um, the other problem that we had is the um, original engineer uh, in 2008 was when these plans first began and that engineer had retired and he was replaced by a new one for this phase of the project. Unfortunately, the new engineer was not familiar with historic timber buildings, um, really didn't understand the strengths of historic timber um, and they began to draw up drawings that were going to replace all of the old growth white pine that this building was made of with um, new structure, select structural Douglas fir. And some of it was actually going to be replaced with I-beams. Um, I arranged to have uh, an engineer um, from Fire Tower Engineered Timber, Ben Brungraber, come and look at it. And he suggested to Henry Ford that they had other options beside that. And so he was hired on to work with them. One of them was, and you saw in the last picture here, we actually turned the outside plates, they were double top plates, and we turned the outside plates into trusses by adding vertical blocks and then adding um, large threaded rods made by the uh, Rathablas company to reinforce those top plates so that they could handle the load. Um, another effort was made um, so that the purlins would be strong enough because the building was constructed with purlins at the rafter level, and then another row of purlins four feet down that basically just connected everything together. But those upper and lower purlins weren't connected. And so what uh, Ben did is he designed um, tension trusses in all of those locations by adding a small vertical post right in the middle of each span and then running tension rods up and creating a tension rod truss. And that gave the strength to the upper purlin that was needed. In order to get those tension rods in, um, we had to do some fairly fancy work to get those rods to go through exactly where we wanted them to be. And so um, that required um, using squares and other types of um, gauging to be able to get those holes in exactly the right line for putting the rods through. And then um, the uh, workers that we had on the job then came in and um, installed all of the brackets, all of the special growth boss screws, and all of those tension rods so that we reinforced the building so that it would be strong enough to, to do what it needed to do under modern building load conditions. This is actually the entire crew that worked on uh, the building. Um, right in the center of this is uh, Jim McCabe and he was the curator of Greenfield Village when the project started. Um, and Jim retired just before we started putting this back up again in 2020. Um, but we made sure to get him involved and make sure that he could be back here um, as part of his dream. Standing right next to him is Eileen Tyler. She was the original engineer, I'm sorry, the original architect of record, but she also was retired, but we made sure to get Eileen back too. Um, this is the wedding bush ceremony. So as many of the people as we could possibly gather together on that day, we got them out in front of the uh, building that we had framed that we had gotten put back up um, and put a wedding bush on. And uh, Matt Olick, who's the red shirt um, on the left-hand side of this picture, um, misunderstood when I said we needed a pine bough when he went out and got a pine tree, which meant this was the first time that we ever had to use a crane to be able to put the wedding bush on top of the frame before we could take our pictures for the celebration. Here you can see, looking at the building from the inside, it's an absolutely stunning building. There's just so much going on. And all of those rods and everything that were added by the engineer um, actually tend to blend in because of all the conduits and everything from the, from the wiring. And in my opinion, um, it's wholly appropriate for an industrial era building. So I don't think it really took that much away from it to do that. Um, and now the building sits 
in Greenfield Village. And to my knowledge, it is the only 19th century timber frame farmer's market still in existence. And today it resides in Greenfield Village.